All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Delisle. I'm a field specialist with UNH Cooperative Extension and want to welcome you here to the Northeast Fruit Consortium Winter Webinar Series. And uh, glad that you all could make it today. We are very happy to have Dr. Beatrice Amiot here with us. She's a research scientist in small fruit germplasm development um, at the Agriculture and Ag Food Canada Kentville Research Station and Development Center. Her program focuses on breeding strawberries, raspberries, and other small fruit for production in Canada. She co-leads the Canadian Berry Trial Network, an industry-focused project which coordinates advanced testing of small fruit varieties in British Columbia, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, um, as well as industry-focused research uh, Amiot conducts uh, some pre-breeding activities, including genetic studies and germplasm development. And so we're very happy to have you here today. And uh, Dr. Amiot, with that, I'll hand things over to you to share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you very much for being with us. All right. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in today. So as mentioned, my name is Beatrice Amiot, and I'm here today to talk to you about strawberry breeding and cultivars, which are my two favorite subjects to talk about. A little bit of an overview of what we'll discuss today. I'll be speaking for about 45 minutes time. We're going to broadly cover the topics of the history of the breeding program where I work. We'll talk about trends in production that we're seeing for strawberries grown throughout New England and in Canada. And then we'll talk to climate adaptation and how both the plants and the production systems are starting to change and uh, what's to come in that area. There's also going to be a quiz. As Jeremy mentioned, there will be two poll slides in the middle portion of the presentation, and you will be invited to answer those poll questions, so please do pay attention. So to start, I want to talk about the history of the strawberry breeding program at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Kentville, Nova Scotia. And so Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada is the equivalent in Canada to the United States Department of Agriculture. We are a federal department that does programming and research in support of agriculture in Canada. So yourselves are connected primarily from the Northeast, which is a large geographic area that encompasses many different horticultural zones from Zone 8B down south, all the way up to Zone 3B in Northern Maine and Michigan. So for strawberry producers among you, you know that this means different types of varieties and different production systems to fit your region and your marketing needs. So where I am is just past the map into the Atlantic Ocean and into the province of Nova Scotia. And so what I will tell you is that the area that I occupy is quite similar to the New England area in terms of climate and uh, the needs of our production systems. The research center where I work is home to about 30 different scientists who work primarily in horticulture. We have researchers who study things on the production side, like myself, I do breeding. We have researchers who do entomology research, pathology, pathology research, and production physiology. We also have scientists who work in the post-harvest space, looking at fruit and vegetables after they come out of the field and into the labs. And so together we work and share this farm that you can see here. We have about 400 acres in production and this land has been occupied by research since the early 1900s where it has been used to evaluate different fruit varieties for adaptation to our region and over the course of the years has been used to do research in different management techniques and in breeding. We are supported by our research station which houses laboratories and greenhouses that uh, we use to perform this type of research. And so the Kentville Breeding Program is, uh, has a long history that started way before myself. We've had five breeders before me pictured here. And so the first breeder at the station was Dr. Edward Eaton, who worked primarily in cranberry and elderberry breeding. Following Dr. Eaton's work, Dr. Don Craig and Lewis Andrews did some work in blueberry breeding and in strawberry breeding. And then before myself, Dr. Jameson, who took over from those two, started really breeding intensively in strawberry and a little bit in raspberry. And so you can see from this list of varieties here that you may have some of these strawberry plants in your own fields if you're a grower, 
or you may have seen them if you've gone to different farm markets to buy specific strawberry varieties. I wanted to take a moment to highlight some of the cultivars from that list and show you some photos of the fruit. So here we have five different strawberry plants that were developed in Kentville, and they're all June bearing strawberry cultivars. So if we go from early to late in the season, we start with our friend Wendy, who was developed in 2006. And this plant is really a nice early berry that gives a little bit firmer fruit than other older early varieties and is a nice producer in that early season. Following Wendy, we have Lila, which was the more recent release since before I started. And Lila is a really nice early to mid season producer with really excellent tasting fruit. So for those of, the, those of you doing you picks or direct marketing, I really recommend giving Lila a try. Next, we have Cavendish. And Cavendish in Nova Scotia specifically is a workhorse in terms of production. It has really excellent and consistent yields. It's a mid-season producer, and it does have resistance to red steel. Next is Kent, and I highlight this variety because although it's quite old, it was developed in the 1980s, it is what we consider to be our winter variety. So for those of you who have real winters with temperatures that go far below freezing, this variety is well adapted across Western Canada and some of those very cold places. And so those of you in Northern Michigan, might consider Kent to be something to try. And then lastly on our list, we have Valley Sunset, which is the latest ripener in our season of Juneberry cultivars. And it is characterized by this large berry, very juicy, very sweet, and quite productive. So that's kind of the wrap up of the breeding program until I started in 2017. And now I'm gonna talk about how things have changed a little bit in the field since I started. So if we take an overview of the amount of berries produced in Canada and how that relates to the world, we can see here on the left-hand side of the slide that strawberry is about number four or number five, depending on where you are uh, from year to year. So we're a major producer of blueberries and a moderate producer of grapes, and then strawberry and cranberry kind of compete for that fourth place. If we look at the distribution across the different provinces on the right-hand side, you can see that strawberries are kind of a minor crop for most of the four main berry growing provinces, but Quebec is the largest producer, followed by Ontario and then Nova Scotia. Although BC produces a, a very large amount of blueberry and grape, it doesn't produce all that many strawberries. Most of the strawberries in Canada are grown in the eastern part of the country or just north of the northeast where you are. Now, if we look to the bottom right hand side of the slide, we see how Canada spits on the world stage. And the short story is that it doesn't. The main producer of strawberries by far is China. And that is followed by the United States, which produces about 1 million megatons of strawberries per year, a very significant amount that is both consumed domestically and exported internationally. Now, you know very likely that California is the major producer of strawberries in the US, but the Northeast definitely does play a significant role. So we'll talk about a few different ways to grow strawberries. And we'll start with kind of the more classic way that uses less infrastructure. And then we're gonna to move toward re more recent ways that include more infrastructure. So on the left-hand side here, you see what we would call a straw matted row production system, where straw is used to cover a perennial planting of strawberries in the winter and then is forked into the rows to provide weed coverage and to provide a bed for those plants to grow on throughout the season. On the right-hand side, we have an image of a raised bed that's covered in plastic mulch and planted either as an annual or as a single year continuous overwintered crop. So already we have the strawberry plants being raised out of that baseline ground level into a raised bed and covered with plastic, giving some protection from weeds and some advantages of early season development. Now, if we go further into the infrastructure investment, we find on the left-hand side here, those same plastic culture raised beds, but they are now covered by a high tunnel. And these polyplastic tunnels provide shelter from rain to the plants, but also to the workers. And they do allow for more production into the early part of the season, as well as later into the fall. On the right-hand side, we have another layer yet of infrastructure investment, and that is the tabletop. 
So you may have seen in your areas or you may yourself be invested in a tabletop production system. This is where the plants are raised off of the ground, planted into a raised gutter, into artificial grow media, and then cropped at about waist height. The advantage here is that you're removing the plants from the soil and thus avoiding any soil-borne diseases. The other advantage is that the workforce can now harvest and maintain the crop at waist height and is not required to bend over. Now, tabletops like these can be grown either under high tunnels or in open air, but are typically partnered with tunnels for that extra protection and season extension. All right, our next big step in cost and infrastructure is the greenhouse. So greenhouses have been popping up throughout Southern Canada, but also in the Northeast in a major way. Greenhouses take the concept of the tabletop and raise it into a more, what we would call high-tech and controlled environment. Here, the crop is isolated completely from the weather by glass overhead structures and raised gutters. We're producing the plants in substrate as opposed to in the soil, and we're controlling what that plant receives from nutrition through drip irrigation. Now, greenhouses provide an opportunity for plants to be grown nearly year round with controlling the temperature within the structure, but also providing sunlight for the plant to grow. The last and most recent innovation in infrastructure around strawberry production is the vertical farm. And so unlike the greenhouse, this system requires that the plants be grown in a closed room with no sunlight access. Instead of sunlight, the plants get access to LED light as their source of nutrition, as well as artificial fertigation. So whereas this system obviously requires more investment in space and time, it provides the opportunity for the grower to both control when and how their crop produces by controlling the flowering time through lighting recipes and then controlling the crop through physical movement of the plants throughout the system. Each of these investments does offer advantages, but as I've mentioned before, the more you go into engineering the environment, the more costly it is. So as we see all of these different production systems in place, the role of a breeding program becomes a little bit less clear. And so I myself as the breeder for Canada have been paying attention to these production trends and in collaboration with our grower groups, I've set certain priorities for breeding. So within the breeding program that I run, we don't only focus on strawberry, but strawberry is the primary goal of our breeding program. We do research into both June bearing and day neutral types of strawberries. June bearers are also called short days and day neutrals are called long days. And um, I will use those terminologies interchangeably, but feel free to call them as you like throughout this talk and as you ask questions. We focus primarily on field production. So those first couple of slides where we saw the raised beds and where we saw the matted rows, those are still the environments that we are breeding strawberries and testing strawberries in our breeding program. We look at fresh market quality. So we want fruit that is not only acceptable to the consumer at the time of harvest, but that can also survive a few days in refrigerated storage and then be available to the grocers for direct marketing. We look at winter hardiness. All the plants that we breed have to survive within Canada in regions that do experience winter and periods of freezing. And then we look at disease resistance as a trait that is beneficial to the grower by needing to reduce the amount of pesticides used. Season extension is a consideration both in breeding day neutral varieties and late ripening June pears, but also we are thinking about how these individual plants that are bred in the field will be brought into systems like the tunnels, like the greenhouses, and then will further adapt to extend the season beyond a traditional strawberry season. Lastly, we're looking at climate adaptability. So what we want is a plant that can withstand the climate conditions in different parts of the country, in different parts of Canada, but also throughout the Northeast, so that as it encounters different climate conditions where you are, it can adapt to what it's experiencing in a particular environment. I'll talk more about that climate adapt adaptability piece as we get into the later part of this talk. So this is where I take a moment and acknowledge that all the work that I proposed under the breeding objectives cannot be done by a single person. This is the team that I work with today and some of the members who have been past contributors to our strawberry breeding program. 
Importantly, I want to har highlight the work of Chad Karens and Ken Goff, who take care of all of our plants in the greenhouse and field. Recently, we had Alison Purcell join us as a technician working in the field and collecting data in line with our students. We have two retired technicians, Beata Lees and Pansy Rand, who were very instrumental in helping me come into the program and learn the ropes. And then we are still very much in touch with the retired scientist, Dr. Andrew Jameson, who bred the varieties that we talked about previously. Along the bottom, you see a number of our students who have worked with us over the summers. And every season we do hire new students to work with us, collecting data, planting, and harvesting our crops. So what the day-to-day -day operations of our breeding program look like are pictured here. In a word, we do a traditional breeding method where we take the plants that we like for different reasons. We collect pollen from one plant and gently apply it to the flowers of another. We then collect all of those the fruit that develop from those cross-pollinated plants. We take each individual seed, propagate it, prep our fields, and then plant those seedlings outside in our environment in Kentville, Nova Scotia. We select individual plants with superior characteristics among their families, and then we multiply those plants so we can evaluate them in larger plots and start to do yield measurements and post-harvest fruit quality measurements. And so that's how our program begins before the stage where we start to propagate them in larger numbers and send them out to growers and to collaborators for advanced testing. I want to take a moment and talk about three cultivars that were recently released by our program. So these are three newest varieties from the Kentville Breeding Program, Audrey, Evelyn, and Kate. When you see this acronym at the beginning of these variety names, AAC, this is simply to note that it's from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So some of the yield characteristics for these three plants, they harvest in the mid-season, similar to a plant like Jewel. And we have seen over the past couple of harvest seasons that Audrey is a strong yielder comparable with Jewel. Kate and Evelyn have less yield capacity in Nova Scotia, but I will show you later on that they actually do quite well respectively in Ontario and Quebec. So if you would like a chance to try these plants in your field, or perhaps you have, you should expect to see similar types of yield characteristics and sim similar seasonality as Jewel. When we look at their fruit quality traits, we can see that overall, these three plants are quite competitive. They're attractive, they're good sized, and they have decent flavor. Where each of them stands out is different. Audrey has really outstanding berry appearance that is rated almost a five out of five at all times. It has consistently red, well-shaped fruit that is proportional and the size doesn't change over the season. Evelyn is the largest of the three new berries with fruit sizes around 18 to 20 grams on average. And then lastly, Kate is the firmest of the three berries. So for, the, for those of you who are involved in wholesale marketing and shipping, Kate is one to consider. All right, so now we're gonna switch focus from the program that I'm in charge of and talk about some work that is done by other labs that we hope to emulate or um, steal from. So disease resistance breeding is critical to the future of strawberries and to really all plants that are grown horticulturally. Dr. Seong Hee Lee from the University of Florida has developed developed five disease resistance markers for the disease you see pictured here. So he's found disease resistance markers for Phytophthora, for Phytophthora crown rot, for angular leaf spot, for anthracnose fruit rot, and for anthracnose crown rot. What these markers mean is that if a plant has this particular version of the DNA, then it has a higher likelihood of being resistant to that particular disease. And you know as well as I do that if a plant is resistant to a disease, then the need to spray to control that disease is reduced. And so the idea would be for all five of these diseases to be controlled within the plant that is resistant as opposed to needing sprays throughout the season. In practice, Dr. Lee and his team were able to map these different genes across a number of different cultivars that are currently available on the market. And what they found was that most of them had this version of resistance to Phytophthora crown rot, and that Tribute and Honey Eye have resistance to Anthracnose fruit rot. 
And so these varieties, if you have seen them in your fields, you may have already noticed that they are more resistant than others to these two different types of rods. There are another set of varieties that he mapped for the four disease genes. And he found that on average, Phytophthora crown rot resistance seems to be quite common among established cultivars. Anthracnose fruit rot resistance is also quite common. And anthracnose crown rot resistance is less common. The variety Dutch Evern and the variety Mara de Bois have resistance to anthracnose crown rot. On the bottom here, you see two numbered selections, and they both have resistance to angular leaf spot. Now, this is quite important because these two varieties here listed as US 4808 and 4809 are not plants that you would grow in a commercial strawberry field. They have small fruit, they're kind of wild looking, but they have been used by breeding programs to take this genetic resistance to, to angular leaf spot and develop new resistance varieties over time. So the University of Florida is working on this and the breeder before me Andrew Jameson started working on this in Kentville a number of years ago. We are very close to developing a variety that has resist resistance to angular leaf spot. Now in my program, we haven't yet had the opportunity to map the varieties in our collection for these resistance genes, but we will do so very soon. And when we have the results, I'm happy to share them with all of you. And I wanna highlight some work done by my colleagues in Ontario, Erica Pate and Justin Rankema and they are working on cyclamen mite. So cyclamen mite, as you can see on the right-hand side here, is a pest that infects the strawberry crown and can cause really devastating effects to the plant growth and development and to the fruit quality. So in their research, what they did was they subjected different cultivars. They looked at eight different varieties, two cyclamen mites, which they inoculated the plants with. And so they put the plants into the field in April of 2021, they put the mites into the field shortly after, and then they counted the mites both that fall in October and again the next, the next summer in August of 2022. What they found critically was that there were different levels of mites depending on the variety. So in the first set of counts, they found that Valley Sunset in particular and also Jewel had a reduced number of mites per leaf than some of the other varieties they looked at. The year afterwards, they found that there was a quite stark difference between the six varieties on the right-hand side and these two on the left, St. Laurent and Malwina, which had higher levels of mites. So for those of you who have encountered mites in your fields, you may have noticed that there are cultivar differences on the mite abundance and the effects on the plant. This is data that shows that indeed there is a variety element to how mites infest strawberries. They also looked at the damage to the fruit that was caused as a result of mite infestation. And so keeping in mind that these were plants that were inoculated with cyclamen mites, there were no controls applied to try to remove the cyclamen mites. And as they were harvested, the effects that those mites had on the fruit were quite distinct. Those same varieties as seen before, St. Laurent and Malwina, had higher incidences of mite damage then the varieties pictured on the right here, Lila, Evelyn, Valley Sunset, and Jewel. And so if you are considering varieties to try in your fields, this may be one of the criteria that you find interesting for your variety choices. To summarize some of their research, they found that Malwina and Saint Laurent were among the most susceptible to, spider to the cyclamen mites. They found that Jewel and Valley Sunset were among the least susceptible. They looked at different reasons why this might be, and they found that higher trichome density could contribute to reduce susceptibility. What does that mean? Well, trichomes are leaf hairs. And so you can see in this picture on the right, as you blow into the end of the leaves, you see that some plants can be quite hairy as shown in the figure A. And then if you look down, some leaves are quite a bit less hairy as shown in figure B. So the thought is that the more hairs you have in that leaf, the less likely those cyclamen mites are to want to stay in that particular plant. Similar findings were also reported by a different lab group that was looking at the two spotted spider mite. So bo both mites have the same response to a plant which has higher leaf hairiness in that they don't like that plant as much as they like a plant with less hairy leaves. So the next time you're in your field, if you notice the impacts of cyclamen mite or two spotted spider mite, 
Have a look at those plants and notice whether they have any differences in the amount of hairiness on the leaves versus other varieties in your field. This research has recently been published by Justin and Erica, and you're welcome to read their paper in the International Journal of Fruit Science. So next I'm gonna talk about climate adaptation. So I had a look at some of the prediction models published by the Northeastern Regional Climate Center. And what this group did was they looked at how the temperature averages compared from the earliest part of the 1900s to the most recent part of the 2020s. And so over this difference in time, which is about 100 years, they found that in the Northeast, temperatures had gone up by about two degrees Fahrenheit on average. So you will have experienced temperatures that are on average two degrees warmer than those of your great grandparents and those before them. This temperature change has already happened and the prediction is that those temperature changes will continue to increase over and above the level seen in the early part of the 1900s. In summary, the Northeast is getting hotter. The same regional climate center also looked at precipitation and here they found that the Northeast is getting wetter. So for that same period of time, comparing the early 1900s to the more recent 2020s, they found about 15% increase in the amount of participation in the Northeast. This is a pretty stark contrast to the other side of the map, which shows a decrease in precipitation of about 15% in the Southern Western part of the country. So in California where strawberries are grown, things are getting drier and that does have implications for strawberry production. It may be that over time, the Northeast plays a larger role in the proportion of strawberries grown in the United States. Continuing on to other climate challenges besides the temperature, besides the precipitation, we know that climate, that the weather is getting more severe. So this is only one example of growers who were impacted by floods happening this past summer, in which they lost a good chunk of their fields to flooding and indeed to uh, complete crop loss in this case. Some of you may have experienced this type of impact yourselves and you know how risky it is to have this kind of condition in your fields. The unfortunate news is that severe incidents are happening more frequently and the examples that I can point to are this past September. So there were five separate major climate events that occurred in the Northeast over September and undoubtedly you will have experienced one or more of them. There were major incidences of flash flooding. There were two hurricane and tropical storm events. And there was a 100 year storm that affected New York City and submerged New York City in eight inches of rainfall. That was highly out of the ordinary. So all of these climate impacts that you can see happening are happening more often and the climate is changing. How do we deal with all this weather? Well, as a strawberry grower, you have two options as far as I see it. The first strategy that you have is avoidance. This is investing in infrastructure that will separate those plants that you're growing from the environment around them. Things like greenhouses, like tunnels, like raised beds. The second strategy has less to do with you, the grower, and more to do with me, the breeder, and that's looking at plants with adaptation. So we're looking here for plants that have the ability to withstand various types of climate events and climate conditions so that they will continue to grow even when the season is not as desirable as it could be. The interesting thing about the strategy B, where we're looking at adaptation within the plant, is that strawberry has actually evolved from a numerical, a number of varied geographic regions. So the four varieties of plants that you see pictured here are the ancestors of the commercial strawberry that we grow today. And the interesting thing about these plants is that they evolved first from Northern Europe, from Ch Central China and Japan, and also from North America. And so within the DNA of the strawberry plants that we grow today is the capacity, or at least the genetic remembrance of adaptation to very different parts of the world. If we look at the plants that evolved into the strawberry that we grow here today, they have ancestry in North America in a significant way. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you see the beach strawberry that is adapted to the West Coast. On the right-hand side, you see the Virginia strawberry, which was first found in Virginia and thought to be East Coast alone, 
but it's actually adapted fairly broadly across the United States and central Canada. In the middle, you have Fergaria vasca, which is widely adapted across North America. And this plant in particular has a major proportion of its genes that were inherited by the commercial strawberry that we know and grow today. Over time, those ancestral types of strawberries were intercrossed and bred into the modern domestic strawberry. So there is potential for these types of ancestral genes to play a role in adapting to climate in the future. And all this is to say that we are not finished with our breeding efforts and there will be more varieties with better adaptation to come. So next I wanna talk about the Canadian Berry Trial Network. And so this is a project in which I collaborate with a number of different researchers from across Canada, and we grow the same varieties in multiple years and multiple locations. So our trial locations are situated first in British Columbia, in Ontario at the University of Guelph, in Quebec, just north of the St. Lawrence River, and where I am in Kentville, Nova Scotia. So when we plant these varieties in collaboration, what we're looking for is plants that are adapted to multiple regions and multiple environments. Taking that same map and looking at them from the horticultural zones perspective, this is the Canadian version of the slide we looked at in the beginning, where zones towards the southern part of the border in yellow are the warmest, and zones further north are the coldest. The trial that we run has the warmest zone in British Columbia, zone 8B, and the coldest zone in Quebec, zone 5B. So if you recognize your own zone amongst these trial locations, you may find their plants that also suit your environment. What I will say is that we found overall that plants that were adapted to the British Columbia environment are not adapted to the east, and the vice versa is also true. So for the, the next set of slides, I'm going to focus only on the three Eastern environments as I present you some results. And so before we go on, I'm just going to take another moment and talk about some climate events that we encountered in the Eastern part of the province throughout the course of this trial. So similar to the recent events you've seen in New England, we also saw some fairly major weather events throughout, the, throughout our recent trials in British Columbia, in Quebec, in Ontario, and Nova Scotia. So we had the heat dome in 2021, which was followed by major flooding in agricultural fields. This past season, we had wildfires across the country, and you yourselves will have seen many of the effects of those wildfires through the smoke that blew into the United States. And then most recently, Hurricane Fiona blew through Nova Scotia and did have some significant crop damage effects. So, in addition to the experiences of New England and the Northeast, the same types of climate challenges were felt in Canada throughout the course of these trials. These are plants that have repeated flowering characteristics, so you'll get an extension of your crop past the typical growing season, both in the field and in other environments. So we looked at many or several different varieties of long day strawberry in Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia. And what I want to show you here in this slide is the relative performance of each variety within its trial year and its trial location. So if you see on this slide here a box that is light green, that means that that variety had a below average performance in terms of its marketable yield in that location in that year. If the box is a me medium green color, that means that that variety was average for that particular location and year. And if the box is dark green, that means that it was above average for that particular location or that particular year. Now, ideally, what we would have seen from this investigation is solid blocks of dark green all across the board. And that would tell us that this one variety is the best variety overall in all conditions. We did not see that. What we saw was a significant amount of variation depending on the year and the location. So. That just means that you know all of those climate events that were experienced in each of our trials, they did have impacts on some varieties more so than others, and that is to be expected. What I wanted to find was, were there any varieties that despite these climate challenges still had either consistently average or consistently above average production in at least two locations in at least two years? And so 
If I looked at it from that perspective, what I found was that within each environment, there were some varieties that on average did consistently over years. In the case of Quebec, we saw that there were some varieties that did very well over the several years. And over all the three trials, there were a number of varieties that had consistently average or above average performance in at least two years and two locations. So these varieties that are either in light green, or sorry, in mid green on the right hand side of the, of the graph or in dark green, we don't see any of those, but those would have been the, the best adapted and the best adaptable varieties from this trial. So to summarize those that had decent and consistent performance over the three years of our trials and in the three different locations, we identified three, four varieties that stood out from among the rest. First off, we have AAC Dynamic. This is a recent variety released from the former Agriculture Canada breeding program in Quebec. We have two numbered selections here, BC1021 and K1631. The BC1021 variety was developed in British Columbia and it is a trial variety that we expect will be named soon. And then K1631 is the first day neutral selection that we tested at scale from the Kentville breeding program. Lastly, we have Seascape, which is a standard cultivar that you likely recognize that has been grown extensively in the Northeast in a day neutral production system. So if we look at their quality attributes, what we can see is that for almost all varieties, the berries met either an acceptable level or a surpassing level of consumer expectations for size, firmness, bricks with just sugar content, acidity, visual appeal, and flavor liking. However, we saw that on average AAC dynamic tended to have fruit that were slightly less large than we would like, and that seascape had fruit that were slightly less firm than we would like. So understanding that you may have seen seascape in your environment and it may be a plant that is perfectly suited to your marketing strategy and to your customer base. This may be the baseline that you accept as confident for your environment, and you may be interested to try these two numbered selections at some point in the future. Dynamic is also something that, if the size is not a concern to you, may be worth trying in your environment. If we have a look at how the berries uh, harvest, these are some photos for you to consider as you think about whether you'd like to trial some of these plants in your own farms. And I would consider that any of these four varieties are worth trialing at small scale in your own production system to determine whether it's a good fit for your variety mix. Moving on to short day strawberries or June bears, in Kentville and in Ontario, we looked at strawberries grown in a matted row production system like you see here. In Quebec, they used the plastic culture raised bed system and we still compared the variety outcomes in terms of marketable yield from one location to the next. We looked at quite a few more June bearing varieties than we did the day neutrals, and that's simply because we have access to quite a few more varieties in the June bearing space than in, in the day neutral space. We've been breeding June bearing varieties for quite some time in Canada, and so we have more to choose from. So we took the same approach of looking at whether that particular plant had an above average, an average or below average yield in a specific location and year. And we found that once again, there were some varieties that had fairly consistent performance in at least two years and at least two environments. There were eight varieties that stood out with that criteria and they're listed here. If we look at their seasonality and their consumer quality scores, we see a little bit different of an outcome than for the day neutral types. So first off, we have Cavendish and Darselect. These are fairly established cultivars in the mid-season, sorry, in the mid-season for Cavendish and in the early season for Darselect. Neither of these two plants had acceptable levels of firmness or a visual appeal. So that is something to consider if you currently grow these varieties and are looking for something else. Jewel, although consistent in terms of its yield in the mid-season, did have fairly undersized fruit and its firmness was not exactly what we were looking for. It did have fruit that was a little bit more acid or sour than the consumer typically likes, but it does have a higher level of sugar content and so that tends to ba balance out that flavor. Next, we have three K14 or K numbered varieties. So these are advanced selections from the Kentville program. 
And whereas 1404 pictured here had fruit that was a little bit undersized, these next two, K1511 and K1621, had consistently large sized fruit and were acceptable or surpassing across the other consumer categories. These last two varieties here are late maturing cultivars from Canada. So summer evening was developed at the University of Guelph and Valley Sunset was developed at Agriculture Canada in Nova Scotia. And Valley Sunset had firmness that was a little bit less than ideal, but everything else was acceptable. Summer evening had fruit that was a little bit undersized, firmness that was a little bit less than we liked, and it had acceptable levels of sugar and visual appeal. So again, these results are for you to consider as you bring new varieties into your mix, whether you are looking for something that is surpassing in all categories, or you're willing to accept some differences in particular categories according to your marketing strategy. So here's those eight varieties pictured. And if anybody does have an interest in testing any of the K-numbered varieties, please do reach out to me because we have a couple of nurseries that are propagating these plants now and are able to share them with growers under trial agreements. So I wanna take a moment and uh, thank some of the partner organizations that made the Canadian Berry Trial Network trials possible and to invite you to visit our report to industry that we submitted last spring which is linked here. And then also to tell you that we are planning to do more of these trials in strawberry, raspberry, and blueberry over the next three years. So that kind of brings me to the end of today's talk. I wanted to bring up a few summary points. First of all, the three newest cultivars from the Agriculture Canada program are AAC Audrey, Evelyn, and Kate. All three of these are mid-season June bearing cultivars that I encourage you all to try. We found from research done at the University of Guelph that resistance to pests such as spider mite and cyclamen mite is associated with the density of leaf hairs or trichomes. We found that research at the University of Florida has made it possible to test different varieties of strawberries for resistance to four major diseases. And we will be doing that work for our own program very soon. And then lastly, we found that a number of our selections from the breeding program do show adaptation to variable climates through the Canadian Berry Trial Network. So for those of you who are interested in access to some of these varieties or to perform tests in your own environment, please do reach out to the nurseries that sell you plants and to the extension specialists who you work with more commonly. So I wanna take a moment again and thank you all very much for your attention and for your participation today. Big thanks to Jeremy and Elizabeth for making this possible and to all of the collaborators who have contributed to this work. I will say thank you again and I'm happy to take some questions. All right, well, thank you very much, Beatrice. And um, what a great presentation. Certainly learned a lot and some food for thought on new varieties that we might wanna try if um, growers aren't already um, growing some of these, but some of these newer varieties certainly sound very interesting. And I think the research being done on disease resistance is probably of particular interest to a lot of us, um, especially after the season that we just experienced with some, some major weather variations as well. Um, excess soil moisture, that sort of thing, it's certainly right on our radar and, and uh, pretty fresh in our memory. So we did have um, one question so far in the chat, and I would encourage folks to um, add more there or um, be thinking of your question and consider unmuting here in just a second to ask that. Uh, but Chuck Souther had a question here um, going back, and he's asking, when looking at the mites in that study, did they consider any other conditions that might have impacted the mite populations, such as grower, cultural practices, presence of beneficial insects, etc.? Yeah, thank you for that question. And so in, in the particular trial result that I was sharing today, the study was designed only to assess the impacts of cyclamen mite on plant growth and berry production. And so they deliberately did not uh, apply any pesticides that would control cyclamen mite or other insects. So that means that there could have been other insect pests or beneficial insects in the trial. However, they didn't count either. What they saw was that when you don't control cyclamen mites and you deliberately add them, of course, you do have damage to the plants that, that come of it. But what you propose to look at beneficials is research, I believe, that has been proposed by that same group.
sorry, I was muted there. So at this point, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to unmute. I see lots of thank yous in the chat. Uh, I do see another question here as well. Um, this one comes from Lori McBride. When evaluating the fruit quality, how did you determine the standard, such as size and taste? Thank you for that question. So when we evaluate fruit quality, we have a consumer panel that will blindly assess the fruit. And we simply use their assessment of, I would buy this berry, I would eat it again, or I would not buy this berry, I would not eat it again as our standard. And so the rates for each of the categories are set on whether that particular threshold was met and those berries were rated as, I would buy it again, I would eat it again. I've certainly had some berries that I wouldn't buy again. So that's a fair yes. assessment, I'd say. Um, let's see, we have another question here. Um, this one um, is coming from Gedney McKay. Pollinization, pollinization in vertical culture, is it accomplished by hand methods or just relying on air movement? So many of the vertical farms that I'm aware of don't publish the methods that they use for their production overall. Um, the few that I have talked to who are willing to share their methods have said that they do use pollinating insects, specifically bumblebees. Uh, but I do believe that hand pollination is feasible if you can do it on time. And I'm sure that others are trying different pollinators as well, but I'm not aware of the full extent of, of the, uh, the work out there. Hi. So I was curious to know um, about um, the prevalence of protected culture there in your region. You know, do you have kind of an estimate on, you know, the percentage of growers that are using some some fashion of protected culture versus open field production? Is it is it pretty common where you are? Um, and are there programs to support that? Yeah, thank you for that. So where I am in Nova Scotia, it's it's not prevalent at all. We recently had a program that did help growers put up high tunnel structures for growing berry plants. And so that increased the adoption um, by a significant proportion of the acreage, but in practice, it was only a handful of farms. So fewer than five farms that uh, invested in that technology. Now in other parts of Canada, like Quebec and Ontario, there is major investment in greenhouse and vertical farms going on at this time. And I believe that there is provincial incentives either on the energy side or on the infrastructure side that help those growers to establish their, their large operations. Okay, thank you. Now the questions are, are rolling in. So I wanna give you a chance to catch your breath in between these. So yeah. uh, let's see, uh, this one comes from Laura Perkins. She's asking, do you have issues with spotted wing drosophila? And if so, how do you deal with it? Would you recommend early bearing to duck the worst of the pressure? So I have to say that I'm really not an expert in spotted wing drosophila. The way that I handle it as a breeder is I call my entomology friends and I say, your traps are in our field, what are they for? And they almost always say spotted wing drosophila. And they almost always find them during our fruiting season, whether it's earlier in the year or later in the fall. Uh, but the general advice that they give that I'll share today is anything that you can harvest earlier in the season is less likely to become uh, negatively impacted by Drosophila. Uh, but I will say that most of the growers in our, in our region that do uh, June bearing and day neutral production are using pesticides to control the spotted wing. Yeah, and I'll just share kind of anecdotally here in our region in New Hampshire, one of the later varieties, I think it's pronounced Malwina. Um, is, for us, that's one of the later varieties grown. And, you know, when we get into that portion of the season where we're harvesting that variety, we do start to see SWD kind of show up as an issue and um, is more prevalent in our traps in the field. Um, but a large percentage of, of our fruit seems to, especially June bearers, tend to escape um, the, the majority of that pressure early on in the season. So it definitely builds as the season progresses. So to be expected that, you know, anything that's day neutral, you know, or we're getting those later in the, in the season harvest would be more susceptible uh, when those populations are higher. Um, let's see. So we have a, one here from Ryan. He's asking, do you have issues with songbirds? Our small strawberry patch would get devoured. Finding ways under our tunnels and um, would go nuts when uncovered and left unattended for a little while. 
Yeah, I've, I've heard that from multiple growers. And um, in the farm where I work, we have issues with crows. So they will and do eat our crop. The way that we handle that in research context is that we try to treat everything the same. So I don't have a, a practical strategy for you as a grower to deal with that. But um, since we have Jeremy with us, maybe maybe you can offer some insight. Oh boy, um, I see all sorts of scare tactics. Um, everything from you know the hanging of the the dead crow or the the rubber crow in the field, um, you know, and, and this we hear this from corn producers a fair bit as well. Um, you know, some of the protected culture berries. I think that's a strategy too. Um, you know, just that physical barrier and exclusion. You know, to some extent, makes it less hospitable for those birds to go in there. Um, so I think those are a couple strategies that I see uh, implemented, um, but I don't have any really good solutions for that. Crows are a smart bird and um, they're persistent as well. Um, so let's see. So we have one getting back to um, disease questions. Uh, we have another one from Matthew. For disease resistance gen genes specific to Phytophthora cactorum, do plants also have resistance to leather rot or just Phytophthora crown rot? So as far as I know, the genetic markers are different for the two different types of rot and the different species or variants that cause them. Evan Lentz asks, any word on efforts for black root rot complex for resistance? The answer to that is it's very challenging because it's indeed a complex and there are multiple species that have different impacts on the plant. That means that each if you were to find genetic resistance for any one of those components to the complex, you wouldn't necessarily have resistance for all of them. Uh, so we don't have a cultivar at this stage that I would say is resistant to root rot disease complexes. And if I'm thinking ahead to implementation of recent findings from genetic studies, how those might be implemented in breeding, we are probably 10 to 20 years away from, from something that is robustly resistant in the field. And uh, that is with consistent effort by programs that are that are highly resourced, such as California and uh, Florida. So it is being worked on, but it's a challenging com com it is a challenging complex and uh, and a tool for a geneticist to work on. Uh, so stay tuned. Okay. Um, interesting. So Andre Tugis um, replied to the issue about songbirds. Interestingly, he says some years they have to cover um, or drape their strawberry fields with old blueberry netting to keep cedar wax wings out of the field. So interesting strategy there and reutilizing some old um, bird netting from blueberries. Uh, yeah, Andre, I don't know if you are able to unmute or you want to share that process about how you're how you're putting that out in the field, um, or if you want to type that in the chat, um, just putting it out by hand over those beds. Yeah. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, we just, it's smart net that we've put into old uh, cardboard pumpkin bins and we just uh, un drive down the row and kind of lay it next to the field and then pull it across the field. And the, the leaves hold the netting up off the fruit um, and we have to just pull it back one section at a time to pick the field. And we just try to break the cedar waxwings habit of getting into the strawberries for maybe a week until they've moved on. Um, but they can be pretty vicious because they can also go into the blueberries and take off clusters of unripe fruit. So we really want to keep them from um, getting established in our fields because we have strawberries and then blueberries and cherries that they'll get into. So with that, I think I will conclude. Thank everyone for being here and spending your lunch hour with us and hope you'll consider uh, joining us for some of our future sessions.